Hello everybody, it is I, Serbadian, welcoming you back aboard the Hype Train. Today we are going to have probably the fastest read-through of a change of this size yet. Ordnance transfer mechanics. Go back a couple of episodes to where I talk about refueling changes and listen to that again with replacing fuel with ordnance. The only differences are fuel per hour is changed to MSP per hour. Hangers are actually mentioned as being able to rearm, whereas they're not mentioned in the refueling changes. And spaceports have been bumped from the original, from the well, new original 2400 to 3600 in total. So they're even more expensive, but they do ordnance as well as fuel. Apart from that, I'm pretty sure this is just a copy paste of the original order. Bit lazy there, Steve. The same can basically be said of the ordnance transfer orders. Uh, it's just copy paste with words replaced. Load fleet, remove fleet, load subfleet, reload subfleet. Yeah, it's basically the exact same thing. The only thing of real note is that missiles get reloaded based on the class loadout and the reload order will remove missiles that are not included in the class loadout so you do need to make sure that your class loadout is set correctly and that you don't have any weird or extraneous missiles uh, and of course colliers are mentioned as opposed to tankers apart from that it's yet yeah, the exact same order so uh yeah let's just move along then shall we all right on to the meat of things we have a nice big change to talk about today planetary terrain so, as part of the ground combat changes, each planet will have a dominant terrain type. In many cases, for many asteroids, comets, or small moons, that type will simply be barren. Within certain environmental tolerances, other terrain types are possible. Any system body with temperature lower than minus 100 degrees or higher than 200 degrees, or with no atmosphere or atmosphere greater than 10 atmospheres will be barren, unless it has platelet or extreme tectonics, in which case it will be mountain. All other system bodies will check the following table to determine which terrain types are eligible based on the environmental conditions. One of the eligible terrain types will be selected randomly. Barren, Mountain and Rift Valley, which are base types available without any atmospheric temperature or water requirements, will only be selected if no other terrain types are eligible. The tectonic numbers are internal to Aurora and have the following values. Number one, dead. Number two, hotspot. Number three, plastic. Number four, place tectonics. Number five, platelet tectonics. And number six, extreme. Terraforming will change the barren under two circumstances. Number one, a planet with a base type, barren mountain and rift valley, becomes eligible for another terrain of a similar type. Mountain can move to any other mountain type, rift valley to any other rift valley type, and barren to any non-mountain, non-rift valley type. Number two, the terrain type is no longer possible with the current environmental conditions. A new terrain type is generated with the same base type. The fortification modifier is a modifier for the max fortification level rather than an automatic defense increase. It means you can dig in much deeper, given sufficient time, in mountains than you can in step or swamp. The two hit modifier is a reduction to in the chance to hit in that terrain for other ground units and any supporting ships in orbit. In effect, fortification is a benefit to the defender, while two hit is a penalty on to both sides. Within the new ground combat rules, you can assign ground unit capabilities, such as jungle warfare, mountain warfare, etc., which will double their chance to hit in those types of terrain. Ground units of species with certain types of homeworld may gain capabilities for free. For example, if you are from a desert planet, you would gain desert warfare for free. There are additional capability options to avoid penalties for ground units fighting on worlds that are outside their species tolerance for gravity, temperature, and pressure. An important factor to bear in mind is that when ships are engaging ground units with surface-to-orbit capability, the main defense of the ground unit will be its fortification level. The ship-based weapons are assumed to hit 100% of the time divided by the fortification level. On a planet with step as the dominant terrain type, the maximum fortification of a static ground unit will be 6, with no penalty for the ship to hit. On a jungle mountain world, the maximum fortification level will be 18 for that same ground unit, and any shots against it by the ships will be modified by 0.125, giving the ground unit an effective fortification level of 144. 
In other words, the ship in orbit is going to hit once every 144 shots. So trying to use orbital bombardment against surface to orbit units buried in jungle covered mountains is going to be a bad idea. It will be far more effective to send in ground forces, which can't be hit by SEO units, to dig them out. Now, this is an extreme example, but there are many more situations where there are some serious decisions for the attacker. Table here for the various terrain types, abbreviations, fortification modifiers, two-hit modifiers, and of course the requirements for hydro, oxygen, temperature, tectonics, and whatnots. And ground units are definitely going to be necessary because planetary defense centers have been removed. Planetary defense centers, essentially ground-based ship, do not exist entirely. Because of the much more detailed ground combat system, including ground combats capable of engaging ships within energy range of the planet, they're not even required, really. There is a lengthy discussion of this change coming up in the next episode of this particular series. But while we're talking about capturing and conquering next episode, what do we actually do with the people we've conquered? Well, that's where forced labor camps come in. As part of the ground combat overhaul, forced labor ground units will be removed. Hands up who actually knew the forced labor ground units existed. They'll be replaced by two new installations, the Forced Labor Construction Camp and the Forced Labor Mining Camp. These each cost 40 build points to build and have the same output as a construction factory and a mine, respectively. Transport size is 100,000 cargo units or four times that of a construction factory. Now, Forced Labor Camps can be built at any population, not just occupied ones. However, they consume 100,000 population and instantly cause five points of unrest. Once built, they only require 5,000 population to man them, serving as overseers, as the bulk of the workers, plus associated basic survival level infrastructure, is provided during construction. This installation has a few different uses. Making a conquered population productive is one, as you can build three of these for a single construction factory or mine cost, offsetting much of the production modifier penalty for occupation status. You can achieve more overall production in one of your own colonies for lower cost if you're prepared to accept the unrest penalty, or you can build these in occupied populations and ship them to your own colonies. Finally, because they have a minimum requirement for a supporting population, you can move them to a hostile world using only a small amount of infrastructure for the overseers. In effect, you can create the Dilithium Mines of Rura Penth if you wish. There are role-playing consequences, as you may not want to play the type of empire that converts its citizens into slaves and send them to mine asteroids. Labor camps are affected by all the production modifiers that affect construction factories and mines, such as radiation, unrest, economic and political modifiers, etc. Although their cheap build costs allows you to offset these modifiers with triple production. The transport requirements take into account the number of integral workers and supporting infrastructure. However, you could ship the potential workers as colonists in a quarter of the tonnage and create the forced labor camp at the desired location. While labor camps might seem low cost and tempting, they do have drawbacks. The large transport size means you could use the same freighter lift for four times as many mines or construction factories. In addition, the 100,000 population cost is actually much higher in reality as you lose all the potential future growth and wealth provided by that population. They will be suitable in certain situations though, where you need to ramp up production and have excess population to support it, if you don't want to wait for a conquered population to improve its political status, or you need a fast way of producing an equivalent to automated mines. The unrest penalty for creation might be a little low, so we'll see how that works in playtest. Now, next, we have some rolling updates to the new game settings and functions. First things first, some changes to the stole system. Uh, Celestia and 2007 OR10 upgrade to dwarf planet status. They are large enough and they probably will confirm at some point. 2007 MB7 asteroid comet with furthest known orbit. C2017 K2 added as a non periodic comet. Umamua interstellar object but treated as extreme distance comet heading outwards. 2007 UV43 Centaur. 2015 RR245 and 2015 KH162 700km diameter trans Neptunian objects added. And Ultima Thule, 30km diameter Trans-Newtonian object. Now, this was last updated in January last year. 
there may potentially be more stuff added that uh, Steve has not updated into Soul. We'll have to wait and see. We also have some changes to game level modifiers uh, added to the new game settings. Uh, a percentage modifier for research speed, a percentage modifier for terraforming speed, percentage modifier for starting minerals in Seoul. Very cool. A flag for active civilian shipping lines. When this is disabled, shipping lines will not produce ships, which is freaking amazing. Although much less amazing now the civilians are not a pox on your processing time. Flag for civilian harvesters that disables uh, fuel, fuel harvesters explicitly. Flag for recovering tech due to conquest, which you can disable if so the new tech is gained via conquest. Light year entry to limit starting NPR locations to within a specific range of Sol. Link there. And an option for Planet X in the Sol system, which adds a tenth planet. You can specify a number of Earth-based player races on the game setup window and you will cycle through a number of race creation windows equal to the number of races selected if you do. You will still need to create any non-Earth-based races after the main game creation process, however. Finally, you also get some changes to starting build points. Uh, a new player race in Aurora receives a number of starting build points equal to two years worth of wealth. These can be spent on instant build for ships and ground formations. If the available instant build point total is greater than zero, the instant build section will be shown on the miscellaneous tab of the class window, including the current instant build point total, plus selection options for destination fleet and number of ships to be built. This section will also appear in if SM mode is active, so additional ships can be instantly built if required by the game setup. If the available instant build point total is greater than zero, it, the total plus the instant build button will be shown on the ground unit training tab in the economics window. When the instant build button is clicked, a pop-up box will allow entry of the number of formations to be built. So basically the exact same thing except for formations instead of ships. If you choose to have automatically constructed ground formations at the game start, the cost will be deducted from the starting build points. The ship options replace the VB6 fast OOB window, while the ground options are new for C Sharp Aurora. So uh, this is very similar to the starting RP system uh, for research. That, but essentially, it's just the fast OOB function instead. Uh, basically, if you have played uh, Rule the Waves, it's your legacy fleet. And that is it for today. A little bit of a shorter episode because I don't want to start on ground units because uh, that's going to be an episode all on its own. But if you're curious about how the ground combat is going to play out, tune in tomorrow because that is going to be an episode and a half. After that, we will continue covering the rest of the changes for C Sharp Aurora every day this month until launch. Down below, links to the official Aurora Discord, Reddit, and the forums where you can join the discussion and the hype. And I will see you next time.